Hello, my name is Andrea Shalal Issa, and we're here today with Wasia Palachuk, a longtime professor at McDaniel College, and before that, Western Maryland College. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting. We are so excited to have you here. You were you taught art here at uh, Western Maryland College, and then later McDaniel for over three decades. At least, yeah. Can Close you tell us? Four. Can you tell us a little bit more about your history? Where were you born? Well, I was born in Ukraine. Uh, most people think it's Russia. It isn't. And I was born uh, where I come from was on the Poland at that time. And I, my mother died when I was six months. I have no idea who she is. My father basically was a slave to Poland. And then the 41, the Russians came and they took him away and I was left by myself in a one-room attached house. No electricity, no water, no nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no clothes. I had one long shirt that had a string and that was my outfit. No shoes, no pants, no nothing. Uh, 41, the Russians took my father. He got, I don't know where he went, for how long. Finally, he escaped. And that was in the late spring. He almost drowned in the river because the ice was breaking. When he came in, the Germans came. And they took him away. So between 42 and 45, he and I were in Germany. He was a slave laborer in a factory, rubber factory. I was a houseboy. Uh, I couldn't go to school since I wasn't German. So all I did is exist and work. In 45, after the war, uh, for some reason, I have no idea. He's not an educated man. He couldn't, I don't know how he found me after three years of not seeing him. So we went in the DP camps, which are displaced persons camp. Uh, one was uh, in Munich. The other one was in SS Caserne, where the SS used to be. It's a huge, monstrous place. And there were just all kinds of people, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, Goyes, Jewish, just a whole combination of people. Uh, I was always the hustler for some reason, because I didn't have anything. So uh, I went on the black market, and I used to collect chocolates and stockings and all that and cigarettes and I went to Munich and exchanged it for bread and for fish herrings and all that. Then I used to go to the camp and hustle it six floors up and down and I'm trying to sell pounds of bread and fish. I, my whole thing was smelly as heck and all but I somehow made it you know because we didn't have that much to eat and all that. I also remember one time uh, I used to go to Marie and Theresienplatz in the center of Munich, and I used to collect buds. And the reason I collect buds because I took them apart and I rolled cigarettes for my father to give him TB and all that, make him sick. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I used to go there, and the American soldiers used to around there flirting with women and all that, giving them stockings and all that for a night. And some of them discovered I was collecting buds. So some of them would light up, and they look at me and boom, threw the cigarette right at me, you know, so I collected it. That was part of my life, you see, in there. And uh, so finally we went to another place, and I got sick in a hospital, spent about almost eight months. Uh, my father was another DP camp. And so here I am sitting on my bed doing some drawing, and next to me was an empty bed. And next day, uh, a, a boy came over and a woman, and she was talking to him and all that. All of a sudden, she saw me drawing and said, what are you doing? And I don't remember what she spoke, English or German, whatever, I thought that was a long time ago. So it came to the point where she says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just sitting here. I don't know what to do. I've been here for so many long months. And then out of the blue sky, she said, would you like to come to America? And to me, I, in, at that young age, I almost said to myself, 
It's like asking a dead guy, you want to go to heaven or to hell? So of course I said I want to go to heaven and I said I want to go to America. And she somehow decided that maybe, she said maybe I can help you go there. So sure enough, sometimes later, she got me transferred from the hospital to an American children's home. And I was spent there about 10 months, and then after that, they got my papers straightened out, and they took me to America. Where was the first place you went in America? Well, they took me to Bronx in New York. And guess what? There was a house on top of the hill, and it turned out to be a synagogue. So on the second floor, the children were sleeping. The, sec the first floor was the synagogue, and the basement was the kitchen. So I remember Saturdays, I used to come down, or holidays, I used to go down to get in. And some guy would say, come, 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 come. I didn't know what he wanted. And so he took me to the synagogue, and so I had to turn out the lights or put the lights on. So I became the Sabbath Goy. Okay. Anyhow, I spent there three months, and then one day uh, they said, We're taking you to the tr tr train station and you're going to Baltimore. So this guy, the driver, spoke Polish, and I understand Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, and a little bit German and all that. And so he, he says, well, I'm taking you to a train station and you're going to Baltimore. I said, Baltimore? Where's the Baltimore? He says, you don't want to go there? I said, no, no. And he says, where do you want to go? I want to go to California. There's cowboys, Indian, and gold. So the guy is handing me the ticket to the train and says, good luck. Baltimore is 200 miles closer to California, and that's how I wound up in Baltimore. What did you do when you came to Baltimore? You were, by this point, you were about 16, 15, 16? Uh, I was roughly 14 and a half, 15, mm -hmm. thereabout. So anyhow, so I came to Baltimore. They put me in an old woman's house. She had some children, and she had an empty room, and she could house somebody like me. And of course, I had to go to school. Now remember, I only had three, third grade education in Ukrainian, and I also three years in Germany uh, without speaking Ukrainian, I forgot Ukrainian. So eventually they put me in a third grade of Ukrainian school. I don't speak Ukrainian anymore, just German. So after a couple months, I got transferred to another camp. So in about roughly a year and a half, I through all this camp, I finished third grade in Ukrainian school. So when I'm in America, what do you do with a guy who doesn't speak English, has thir third grade education in Ukrainian? So they put me in the ninth grade. Ninth grade. I remember I don't speak English. I don't know what to talk about. You know what? After that first year, I was put on an honor roll. And uh, the reason why I did all right was there was a, 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 a lady, a woman who is a history teacher, and she's the one who spent time with me, Ke Lida Keating and me, and she was wonderful. So women are the ones who saved me all my life. And you're still in touch with her? Uh, well, actually, she's, uh, she's dead. Oh, right? she passed away. Yeah. The oh. lady who helped me come to America is still a little, a little. She's 30, 10 years older than I am, 87. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. You're, you've been very lucky. You've had a lot, very difficult life, but you've been very lucky in, in all of Totally it. not by my control. It's totally accidentally. It's like I came to this college here, totally accidentally. But you make your own luck. Too, well, you, uh, you have to work. You have to be able to make, make the best out of what you have. Mm -hmm. You want me to tell you how you got to college? Here? Absolutely. How did you uh, come here? Well, after finishing bachelor's degree and master's and master of fine art uh, and four years of Air Force in a SAC, I was going to open a studio in Baltimore. And I get this phone call from a woman. 
know who she is, Lois Shipley from Western Maryland College Art Department. And she says, I'm a friend of Lida Kitty, your ex-teacher. And I was wondering if you would like to teach. I said, teach? I'm trying to open a studio in Baltimore. And you want me to teach? I said, not particularly. She said, why don't you come over? So sure enough, I came over to the art department of Western Maryland College. I meet this woman, Lois Shipley. She's nice and talks to me and all that. Sure you don't want to teach? I'm not sure. We talked, and after about half an hour, she signed me up without any papers, without anything at all. Just took my word and took my ex-teacher's word and hired me right on the spot. You better not do that again. They, that's illegal. Can't do it. But I had uh, two master's degrees, and I, and I was teaching summer school, and I was running an intelligence department in SAC Ackerman, so I wasn't exactly the dumbest, but you know. Mm. So. How did you find teaching then? Did you enjoy teaching? I loved teaching. I, I, I cannot imagine not doing anything else. First of all, some teachers were complaining, oh, you know, the salary is this and all that. I said, look, who do you know that has January off? Who do you know has weekends off, you know, two or three days? Who do you know has a summer off? And if you don't like the salary, take this three months off, two and a half months in summer and get a job, you know? No, I love teaching. I think teaching is fantastic. I love teaching and here was, I had no problem for all these years. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, see a lot of changes in Carroll County over those years? Oh, Carroll County, of course, yeah. It was quite a, a little, uh, well, I don't want to mention it, but it was obviously not what it is now. Mm -hmm. And the college obviously changed. I mean, there's all these buildings and all this, and totally changed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think for the better. Yeah. I think very highly of this place. Um, when you um, first kind of began, can you talk about how you became interested in art? How did this interest develop and how did you sort of know that you, this was your calling? I didn't know it's my calling. It just happened. As I said, in, in, in Ukraine where I was the poorest of peasant you can find, uh, a house, may, a room maybe twice as big as this, undetached, no running water, no heating, no nothing. Uh, I had no paintings, n no drawings, no art, no sculpture, no paper, no pencils. I didn't know what art is about. Except in the spring when it was uh, you know, raining, uh, the Ukrainian black soil it becomes very muddy and all that. And I noticed some kids were collecting there and making, I don't know what they were making, some kind of pies or I don't know what they were making. And for some stupid reason, I have no idea where it comes from, uh, I started to build something. It wasn't pies, it wasn't sculpture because I didn't know what sculpture is, but I was sort of building it. I mean, I didn't even know whether it was human or animal form, but I was just building it up. That was one of my beginnings, you see. Oh, one time I also forgot. Uh, the walls were almost as white as this, and while my father was working for Poland and all that, uh, once in a while, he, well, most of the time I was by myself at home. So once in a while I got bored and I didn't know what to do. So I saw this stove that was burning wood. Of course there's black chalk, you know, there, you know. So for some stupid reason, I have no idea, I went and picked up some of those things and I look around. Anyway. So I started to do the whole wall in that black lines. I didn't know what I was doing. It wasn't like figures or anything. I was just doing it. Well, my father came home and he beat the tar out of me. And that, if I would have been wise, would have told me don't become an artist. But no, it's just the opposite. I became an artist. I don't know why. Persistent spirit. It's, huh? I don't know why. It's really a puzzle. My whole life is a puzzle for me. Uh. 
And um, so when you were in high school, then you started to um, take art classes. And I mean in high school in, in America. In high school in yeah. America, yeah. Yeah, well, and the thing is, uh, after I, oh, when I came to America, I had great, um, third grade education, couldn't speak English. They put me in a ninth grade, okay? After finishing ninth grade, not speaking English, well, I was put on honor roll. And then all of a sudden, they decided to do something with me, put me in a ninth, in a, what do you call it, in a tenth grade, but to Baltimore City College, which at that time was one of the six best high schools in America. Why put me in there? I don't hardly speak English. Why put me in there? Sure enough, I spent the 10th, 11th, and 12th, and finished with a scholarship. Fantastic. And then you went on to study art at the University of Maryland? No, that was uh, after that. All of a sudden, I get this letter from U.S. government telling me, we're drafting you. I said, are you kidding me? I survived Poland, Russia, Germany, and I came in here and they want me to put in and go in the army? I must be crazy. So I was going to go to the Navy. I don't know why. I don't, you know, take a like. And I walk in and the guy says, can I help him? I says, yeah, I'd like to join the Navy. And of course I had an accent. And he says, are you a citizen? He says, no, I'm not a citizen. I'll only be here three years for some year. That we, we can't take you. And I said to myself, this is America. The Army was drafting you. The Navy can't take you because you're not a citizen. So I said, well, there's something going on. So I said, OK, why not join the Air Force? So I went to the Air Force recruiter. He says, can I help? I said, yeah, I'd like to join the Air Force. He says, OK, just sign in the air and all that. And he says, what can you do? I said, well, I speak Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, and a little German, and a little bit of English. Huh? He says, OK, we can use you, you know, as almost like they would take me into intelligence, you know, OK? So I signed up, and after three months in here in New York, they transferred me to Washington State. SAC command, bombers, OK? So what do you do with a foreigner who can't read too well, can't speak too well? They put him in the hospital as a clerk typist. First, I don't know what the typing is about. Second one, I have no idea about language writing now. So sure enough, three or four months, that's where I am, a clerk typist. Finally, there's a lieutenant coming in, and he looked around. He, we talked and all that. And he says, what are you doing here? I said, you tell me, I don't know. They said, would you like to be transferred? I said, of course. So he transferred me into the intelligence section, and I became a draftsman illustrator. I had my own section. I had people working with me and all that. So I spent three and a half years in intelligence as a draftsman illustrator. For the bombers, you know, when they go into bomb and they coming back, you know, they have to be briefed and debriefed and all that. So that was my job in the Air Force. Also in Guam, I spent three and a half months in Guam. That's in case, you know, there's a war, they want you to transfer things and all that. So that was my Air Force, and then I came, got discharged, and what do you do? You gotta go to school. So I went to the University of Maryland, finished my bachelor's in three years. Then I became the first candidate for a Master of Sculpture. So I got my, fa uh, my Master of Art degree. And then I went to Baltimore, I was going to open a studio. So I get this call, as I told you, uh, from a guy who says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm trying to open a studio. He says, did you ever consider going to Maryland Institute of Reinhardt Sculpture? I said, no, why? So well, they give you a master's degree of fine art, they give you a free studio, they give you free tuition, and all that. And I said, no, not really. And then all of a sudden I woke up and said, a free studio, free tuition, free thing, and a master of fine art. And you know, if I wouldn't have the master of fine art, I couldn't have a job in here.
<laughs> because to be uh, a, a good teacher or qualified teacher, you have to have a master of fine arts, not just a master of art. Mm -hmm. That's how I got a job here, because of that. Accidentally, I didn't ask for it. Wow. But if somebody is giving you free tuition and free studio and all that, you're in, in, uh, you know, imbecile not to take it. So. Well, you've been very well recognized for your work. You are, um, your, your sculptures are in many places, and you just got some good news today. You oh told yeah, me. oh yeah. I, for some reason, I was invited to Paid, Estonia, for the first time. I was the only American out of over a hundred people, artists. And why I was recommended, I have no idea. So I went there to Paid, Estonia, and you walk in and they give you a stone. My stone was 11 feet tall, or huge. Uh, and they gave you 10 days to carve it. I am a stone novelist. I write my novel in stone. So I took that stone and I started carving, 10 days. I carved it and finished it, went to America, and guess what they did? They took that stone and in the center park in Pais, they have a fountain, then they have a museum, and my stone sculpture is right in the middle between them. And I said to myself, that's a marvelous. It's a miracle. Why would it happen to me? Two years later, they call me again. And I said, it's not real. It's, it's a, not a nightmare, but it's definitely not real. So I went again. Well, I selected another huge stone, 10, 12 feet tall. And that was Pais or Estonians, 900, I mean, 90 years of independence. So I'm a novelist. So what do you do? You write about Estonia 90 years of freedom. So I had this man image of a realistic man with a woman with a baby holding, and I had a, an abstract 90, then I had all kinds of other symbols and all that. And I carved it and I left. And for years I didn't know what happened. Today I'm getting a message by some guy who has a connection named Bob, and he says, guess what? The sculpture piece is right in front of the city hall in Pais. They just put it there. What an know. incredible honor. Uh, unbelievable, you know, it's, uh, and there were hundreds of artists doing there. They had some, you know, all over the city, but nothing like that, I mean, I don't know why. So somebody likes it. Well, apparently. Yeah. You, where can you tell us where some of your sculptures are? Well, besides Estonia, and we should say that Paid is the sister city of Westminster. Westminster. That's how they got connected. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my biggest six and a half ton fountain granite stone is right here between uh, the chapel and the, and the library, mm -hmm. and that's a story of art story of education, story of humanity, story of history and all that. And it has water spouting out of the wisdom of an owl, which is supposed to be wisdom of the teachers. Mm -hmm. And then of course I have that uh, a piece of steel sculpture piece as you enter the college on the left side of President's, uh, almost said palace, President's a house, there is a sculpture piece called The Welcome, mm -hmm. and I did that. And of course, there are all uh, coins of stones that I brought in that is still there. And uh, there is one of my biggest painting in the president's uh, room that they bought for $600. Well, it's probably about $6,000, you know, but it's in the president's room. And the lady who is in charge put it there so you can see it right away. <coughs> and then I have stone and uh, I mean I have sculpture piece in a community college and then I have some uh, thing in, in uh, cemeteries in New York and then I have some what else oh yeah there's this huge sculpture piece in uh, 
I always forget the place, but uh, Taylor. Taylor Manor, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a huge one in there. So off and on, yeah, I have some sculpture pieces, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how your early history and the poverty and just the you know the deprivation you experienced influenced and shaped your life in terms of your art and what sort of themes you explore in your art? Well, basically, I'm exploring my life, not yours. I don't know your life, okay? I'm telling a story about my life as I'm telling a story about this college, about this uh, education, about in here. So basically when you see my uh, paintings, they usually have something to do about my background. They have something to do with Ukraine, they have something to do with my poverty, and something to do with, uh, I'm a Ukrainian hillbilly, and, and, and Ukrainian to be a hillbilly is an honor, it's not a derogatory, because they're the most creative carvers and designers and all that. So uh, I like woods, I like, and also I spent uh, years in Bavaria and Germany in, uh, in the mountains, which obviously I enjoy, you see. So. But anyhow, I, I'm talking and I'm describing about my background. Uh, yours are sometimes included, but basically I'm telling a story about myself. Mm -hmm. What do you think what do you think makes it possible for someone like you to survive such such d difficulties? I had no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like nobody asked me. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked my mother died over six months. I had no mother. Mm -hmm. and nobody asked I was under Poland and the, my father was away most of the time. I was basically like a village dog, okay? I had no family, no connect, nobody told me what to do. I had a long shirt, uh, I mean, shirt that had a string attached around, no pants, no shoes. Nobody told me what to do. I was starving to death. I went and tried to pick, steal some apple or do something or find some berries. Uh, I don't know why. I, I can't explain. Mm. It just happened. I mean, it's, I came to America, I couldn't speak English, so what, you're supposed to just lay down and die? No, I did my best. Mm. I had no parents, no father, no mother tell me what to do or not to do, you know, it mm. just happened. Um, do you think that, um, you know, Americans uh, appreciate and, and, and cherish art as much as they should? Are you... You know, what do you think about our society and how the place that art has in our world? Oh, I think art is uh, obviously everywhere you go. I mean, you can't avoid not to have art. Now, it's quite clear that if you're an artist, you have a little tougher time. Uh, some of us are very successful and make millions and all that, and some are just barely existing. I personally think that if I weren't a teacher in here, I probably would make a living, but I wouldn't survive as well as I did as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And of course, being a teacher, and you're showing, you have students and all that. Uh, even now, I was, I'm was i already invited to judge a show in York and Hanover and all that, uh, uh, to judge. I'm the only judge, uh, judging 300 plus pieces of work. I mean, come on, I mean, that's quite a job. So. Yeah, you, you do get some benefit out of it, but no, I, I think Americans are good art uh, supporters and everywhere you go you see art and all that, so no, I don't, I don't have any problem. And you've mentioned that you're interested in bonsai now. How did you yeah. become interested in that? That's a natural hillbilly thing. I, I like trees, you know, and I like to see what they do, and I'm fascinated by bonsais. I went to, to the uh, Arboraria in uh, Washington, and I saw, listen to this, I saw a tree that is that big, approximately, that is over 300 years old. Do you understand what I'm saying? For 300 plus years, somebody had to water that daggone thing, had to trim it once in a had to replace the soil, had to, you don't have an imagination what it takes to, you know, you have children and you would raise them for two years, three years, five, 10, 20, 21. Oh my God, there's 21, you know. 300 plus years of bonsai like this. 
how can you not be fascinated? So anyway, so I like to trim them, I like to grow them, and I always say to some as a joke, but the serious, they say, what would you like to do if you wouldn't have all this stuff you have to do? I said, I would like to be a bonsai grower and a stone carver. That's, for some reason, would be my ideal life. And when you say stone carver, do you mean sculptor, or do you mean carving words in stone? No, no, not words. No, my, my words are illuminated. My words are not in letters, okay? I'm not a letter writer, see? So I'm still a pretty, no, writing is not one of my strong things. Mm -hmm. Sculpture is my, my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, how, uh, do you still paint and, and sculpt, or have, they, have you sort of retired from? I, I don't know if I'm retired, but I definitely am not a painter sculpt anymore. I still am who I am, but I, got s I have so much stuff. I got so many paintings, so many sculpture pieces, I can barely lift them. I don't know what to do with And my idea is, you tell me, why would you produce more if you don't know what to do with what you have? So basically, I'm sort of retired mm -hmm. as a painter and sculptor. Doesn't mean I couldn't do something if you asked me to, but basically, I'm too involved restoring houses and taking care of the family thing a sick father-in-law and this and that, but right now painting and sculpture is not one of my things I would do. <coughs> do, um, do you have um, sort of an idea of what you would like to see happen with those sculptures and paintings? What would you like to see ideally if you could choose? Well, ideally, if, uh, I, I'm almost willing to give half of them to some gallery or museum or somebody or to school or something. Uh, but it's very hard to find somebody, you know. I have this huge painting that I did that is almost as big as this wall, and I don't know what to do with it. I was uh, offering it to the Bolo Museum uh, because I was teaching there for 10 years, you know, and all that. And they say, well, we we're glad to, but no, it's uh, maybe a historic society because it has to do with, uh, okay, what it has to do is this. I had no home no family for years. I came to America and finally after being 30 something years old I'm buying this house you know on 25th Calvert and 25th in Baltimore. I'm buying this house and one day I'm in the yard uh, doing whatever and I hear over the radio the neighborhood burning, looting, raping, killing and I turn around and says you dumb so and so. You survive all that, and then you're buying your first house, your first home in this neighborhood. So that got me so upset that I took this huge canvas, I would say at least as big as that, and I painted this canvas of burning, looting, graping, get all oh God knows, you know And I have it, and nobody wants it. And it's a Baltimore history. Mm -hmm. so the museum told me to go to Baltimore Historic Society and see if they can use it. What year was that? What decade? Uh, that was in the late 60s, 70s or something. I don't, I don't know. The, my dates are all messed up because I forget things, but that was at that time, and yeah. I was very upset. Well, you've experienced a lot. I mean, Baltimore had some very um, difficult times oh, after yeah. the assassination yeah. of Martin Luther King. Oh, there yeah, were sure. extensive riots. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I really was very upset. Just mm -hmm. And I still have it, and I don't know what to do with it. I almost was going to burn it, but I said, no, no. I couldn't is find a match. So painting is a kind of a therapy for you? I don't know if it's therapy. I think it's something that I have to do, or want to do, or something in my life possesses it, to do it. And I don't know why, but uh, as of now, I don't know what to do with what I have, so I don't want any more. Mm -hmm. Do your students still keep in touch with you? Yes, there are quite a few students still in touch with me. I get, I see some, as, as a matter of fact, two days ago somebody calls me all the way from Florida. I don't even know who the heck it is. Well, it's one of my ex-students wh whose mother was one of my students, and he said, well, I just thought about it, and I wonder how you're doing, and all that. 
and there is a student in here who, who is teaching photography who has a show and he, I know him as a student you know so yeah there are quite a few students and they are very good students as a matter of fact um, uh, one L Linda von Hart is one of my first students she, as a matter of fact, when I first came in and started teaching, she was one of the first students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now she teaches here at McKinney. Oh, she's been also. teaching here quite a while. Yeah, she's something else. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. You must have touched so many lives over uh, the Ellen Van Diesen, the one who did the mural, you know, mm -hmm. she was one of my students. She was, and she's running everywhere. She's painting murals all over the place and all that. Oh, she's fantastic. So, yeah. no, no, they, it, it was a great experience for me. That's wonderful. Do you, did you ever get a chance to go back to Ukraine? As a matter of fact, in 91, after 91, when they finally could get rid of the Russian communists and they finally allowed you to go back, I decided to go because before that, if I were, first I don't know if they would have let me in, second one, since I was under Germany during the war, whether I liked it or not has nothing to do with the Russians. That means I was not qualified to be um, a Ukrainian or Russian thing. So they would have probably put me in Siberia or something. I know they would have put my father in Siberia or killed him because he was in a, a rubber factory. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the Germans were the first inventor of, fa uh, of fabricated rubber? Mm -hmm. They were the ones who make. So you can imagine being a slave laborer in a factory of rubber. Can you imagine the smell and all that in there? Well, he would definitely would have been put in Siberia or killed. So yeah, after 91, I decided to go. And I went to my ex-village and other places. I didn't know anybody, obviously. Uh, my house, the, my house, the house that I was living in is not there. They destroyed it, you know, it's nothing but flat. Uh, and I saw some people who might have known my father or so, but it wasn't much contact, so I don't have any contact with him. What was the <coughs> name of the village where you were born or where you grew up? Well, uh, the, the village that I left was Juryu, and then I was, my father was born in Novoselitsia, and they're little tiny places in the hills, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, they're not, most of them not even on the map, so. Mm -hmm. Your father was able to join you in the United States after some time. Yeah, after he, after two years me being here and all that, I, I helped to sponsor him here, but he, he, he wasn't very happy. He just had enough. So after a couple of years, he died. <coughs> he had a very hard life. Yeah. Yeah, and you have a, a wife and two children? Yeah, I have a wife, Oksana, and we have twin girls, mm -hmm. Xenia and Natalka. Xenia is married, has two children in Philadelphia with a, a nice Italian guy. And uh, the other one, Natalka, is just, she doesn't know what she wants yet, so. So how does it feel to be a grandfather? Did you imagine when you oh. were a little boy someday, could you imagine yourself being a grandfather? I don't know. I don't, you know what? I cannot get over what women go through to raise two children. I still would say, I don't know who somebody would condemn me, I still would rather have a job than take care of two children and cooking and all that. That is a heck of a long job, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of it is not appreciated. I do appreciate it because I tell you, when I see my daughter Xenia would come and she, they just left because of my birthday, uh, they just left. And it's a 24 hours, they get two or three hours of sleep because one kid is sick, the other one doesn't eat, they do this. So I, I really don't envy women, I tell you, that's a heck of a job. Are your kids, your grandkids, artistic? How do I know? One is seven months and the other one is uh, two and a half. Are you going to teach them art? I'll teach something, but personally, between you and me, I would not encourage them to be artists. Why not? I, because, you know, art is, is a, it's a choice that you have to make yourself. It is not a profitable thing as a rule. It doesn't mean you can't make a living. It just means that it's 
a little bit more difficult you mm -hmm. see, to make a good living. So you have to really be exceptional or lucky, lucky or somebody discover you or what, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. So be whatever they're going to be, it's all right with me. She, she's like a ballerina, she likes to dance, and all he does is smile. He's only six months, that's all he's doing, he smiles. <laughs> His name is Matteo. And your granddaughter? My granddaughter, Sophia. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything that you'd like to sort of, you know, say that we haven't talked about? There's a lot of things I could talk, say about what we're talking but basically I think we've sort of had a, a good beginning and you have some more of my resume in there and all that, but we can always talk later on if you want, so. Uh, plus you have to go someplace, don't you, so, you know. <laughs> thank you so much, Wesiel. Thank my, you for joining us today. My pleasure, thank you. Thank it's a pleasure you. seeing you again and to say hi to your hobby and all that, okay? <laughs>